here in Psalm chapter number 51. I want to focus at the end of the chapter, beginning in verse number 15. The Bible reads, O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. Verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Now, when we look there at verse number 16, he alludes to the fact that a sacrifice or a burnt offering would not please God. We see throughout the Old Testament that, that God does command them to bring the sacrifices, doesn't he? And, of course, he wants the, you know, the children of Israel, he wants David, he wants all of his followers, all of those that worship the Lord, to obey the laws of the Lord, correct? So he's not saying, or David's not saying here, that God just doesn't want them to bring the sacrifices. Of course, that is the commandment, is to bring the offerings, it is to bring the sacrifices. But he explains what he means in the next verse. So again, one more time, verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. So what David is teaching here is that he doesn't want you just to be going through the motions in the obedience to God. He doesn't want you just to be doing things outwardly but not have the truth inwardly. This is actually taught previously in this chapter. I want you to look with me up in verse number 6. It says this, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. The title of the sermon this evening is Serving God in Sincerity and truth. Serving God in sincerity and truth. That's actually taken from Joshua chapter number 24, verse number 20, or verse number 14, and it reads, Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. I'm going to be preaching tonight about the importance of serving God in sincerity and and in truth, serving God with the right heart and not just going through the motions, not just practicing traditions, not just doing what was passed down to you, but rather actually serving God from the heart and desiring, as it says here, to do that which is right. Desiring to do things in truth and to be pleasing unto God. There are a lot, a lot of different motives, and we're going to look at that through the sermon this evening on why someone is not serving God. Excuse me, in sincerity and in truth. First, I'm going to give you, we're going to go through points in your life where you need to be serving God in sincerity and in truth. The very first point is that you need to be going soul winning in sincerity. I want you to go to Mark chapter number 1, verse number 40. So you ask, well, what do I mean by that? You need to be going soul winning in sincerity. Well, what is the purpose that we go out to go soul winning? It's in the title. It's to win souls, right? It is to save people from <coughs> A burning fire, a burning hell, right? Well, when you go out, you should be going out in sincerity. You should be going out in sincerity and truth and caring for those. You should be truly going out with the purpose of, I don't want you to go to hell. So what would it be? What would be the state that you should be in when you leave, whether it be the church building as the departure location, someone's house? What mentality or what state of mind should you have? I'm going out there. I'm going to be knocking on people's doors, and I care about these people. I want to deliver them from hell. That's the reason why you go soul winning. Now, now I want you to be honest for a moment. Has every time you went out soul winning, is that what you're thinking about every time? Or sometimes do you just overlook the purpose why you're out in the first place? Of course you do, right? Do you go soul winning every week, multiple times a week? Sometimes you're just going through the motions, aren't you? Now, here's the thing. You don't think that there are a lot of people that are out soul winning doing that? You're wrong if you don't think that. Maybe if you haven't experienced that in its fullest, you know, maybe you haven't been going soul winning long enough, number one. But, or number two, you know, maybe, maybe you just have the right heart in this area. You know what you need to do? You need to hang on to that. You need to figure out what it is that causes, you know, the, a lost world to pull at your heartstrings, and you need to keep that there. Because the purpose why you go soul winning is to deliver souls from hell. That's the reason. You should be caring about people. You should be going to people's doors, and you should be having compassion on people. Let's look at our ultimate example here, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. When he went about teaching and preaching, we're going to see that he had compassion on those that he ministered to. He had compassion on those that he was preaching the gospels to, that he, the gospel to, gospels, preaching dispensationalism up here, the gospel to. Look at uh, Mark chapter number 1, verse number 40. Mark chapter number 1, verse number 40. 
It says this, There came a leper to him, beseeching him and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And then it says this, verse, verse 41, And Jesus moved with compassion. That's a powerful statement. In Jesus, it says, moved with compassion. Saying, moved with compassion. You know what it means? It means that it stirred him up. When he heard the words come out of this man's mouth, it said, if thou, it, it says this. Let me read it one time so that I don't, uh, I don't misquote it. It says in verse number 40, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. So you see the humility of this man as well. Just saying, if thou wilt, if you want to, you can make me clean. He doesn't even directly ask him. And it says that when Jesus looked at him and he heard this, it said that he was moved with compassion. Look what it says next. It says, put forth his hand and touched him and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. So we can see that Jesus, when he went about his ministry, of course, he's our ultimate example. He was not just going through the motions. What was he doing? He had compassion on those that he was healing. He had compassion on those that he was ministering to. He had compassion on those when he was going out and he was preaching the gospel. Jude... The book of Jude, verse number 21 through 23 says this. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And then it says this, verse 22. And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. You are commanded by the Bible to have compassion on those that you go to win to the Lord. Now, let me tell you this, too. When you go to people's doors, and I know I've said this before, but when you go to someone's door and you knock on their door and you begin to speak to them, from the very beginning, people can tell whether you're a salesman or not. From the very beginning, someone can tell whether you are actually doing this and mean this in sincerity and in truth. When you see someone coming to you to uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, pitch something to you, whatever it may be, or try to give you something or present something to you, whatever we're speaking about, you can tell whether they really believe in their product or not most of the time. You can tell whether they actually have confidence in what they're telling you, whether they actually care about you. And when you go to someone's door and you knock on their door and you start talking to them and presenting the gospel to them, they can tell whether you're going through the motions. Let me ask you this question, Soul Winner. When you go to their door and you're talking to them, can you tell whether or not they're just standing there out of, I feel like this is duty and I don't want to be rude to tell you to go away? Or are you stupid enough to think that they can't tell the same thing about you? Of course they can. When, you're, when they're standing at the door with you, they can see by the look on your face, by your mannerisms, by the words that are coming out of your mouth, they can see whether you're here in sincerity and in truth. They can see whether you're really here and you're actually having compassion on them. You know, that makes a difference. When you can tell that someone actually cares about you, when you can tell that someone actually believes what they are presenting to you, that makes a difference on the receptibil in the receptibility of that person. It, it really and truly does. You're commanded as a soul winner to go, to go soul winning and to have compassion. That's how you're going to serve God in the area of soul winning and sincerity and truth. It's going to be having compassion on those that are lost. Amen. Having compassion for those that are dying and going to hell. Don't, don't you wish that, uh, and aren't you happy that someone came to you at some point and they had compassion on you? I'm sure the person that gave you the gospel, when you heard the words of the person that was preaching the gospel to you, that you know whether or not they had compassion on you or not. You know whether or not they truly felt for you when they were preaching the gospel to you, whether they really meant it, whether they cared about you, if it was a one-on-one -on -one, you know, uh, type of scenario, right? Have compassion on those that are lost. Love those that are lost. You know, they are other people's family members. They have family members somewhere connected that are, are saved that I'm sure desire them to be saved as well. Desire this person you're speaking to to be saved. Don't you have plenty of family members that you want to be saved? Well, think of that when you go to these people's door. That's someone's mother. That's someone's you know, grandmother, their father, their brother. Have compassion on them. Love them. God wants them to be saved just as much as he does others. Okay? So have compassion. How to be sincere and soul winning? Have compassion. Have compassion. I want you to go uh, now with me to Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. Tonight, this evening's sermon is very practical, but it's probably going to be short. Uh, it's something that I would love to, for you to take with you, though. Very important to take this with you and start applying this in your life. Think of this you know, as you go out to, to uh, you know, put these things into practice, keep these things in your mind. Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. After the book of 
Proverbs, of course, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. That's Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. The next point is children, children, when they're serving God, they need to be serving God in sincerity and in truth. We here, obviously, at Value Baptist Church, we do not, we have integrated services. We do not have separate areas where the kids go. We don't have a, a, a secondary service where we're going to put the children in. We wouldn't have somewhere to put them in the first place, but we don't have, you know, another place where we're going to put the children, right? And the reason being is, is for this purpose. We want the kids to serve God in sincerity and in truth. And I'll tell you what happens when you take them and you put them into a service where you're gearing the services toward them, where you're gearing the services toward the children, the reason why they're interested is because they're not serving God oftentimes in sincerity and in truth. What you have to do is you have to mix in other things that they are interested in. You have to mix in other things that are going to cause them to keep their interest. But you know what happens when they're in the service with just the Bible and they start serving God, they actually start listening to the preaching, do you know what they're doing? They're serving God in sincerity and in truth. They're not just there for the Kool-Aid, right? They're not just there because, hey, we're doing crafts, or hey, we're doing this, or hey, we're doing that. There's, they have no other option. You know what they're going to end up doing? Serving God in sincerity and in truth. And that's what we want. It's the same concept with our services here. If you walked into, it's the exact same concept. If you walked into Cornerstone down the street, if you walked into the vineyard down the street and the lights are on and some guy's up there and they're trying to make it as worldly as possible, would you say that the people that are going to that church are serving God in sincerity and in truth? Why? Because they're there for the entertainment. That's what happens with the children. They end up enjoying it because this is entertaining. They're not enjoying it in sincerity and in truth that, hey, I love the Bible. I love doctrine. I love Jesus. No, they're enjoying it because it's entertainment, because you are, you know, you're, you're allowing them to have fun. We want our kids to serve God in sincerity and in truth. I want my children to love Jesus to the core. I want them to love Jesus from their hearts, to really love the Bible. Look here at Ecclesiastes chapter number 12, verse number 1. It says this. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. So look at that, that, that strong exhortation in the very beginning. Those are powerful words. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. We need to exhort our children to remember their creator in the days of their youth. Amen. Isaiah chapter number 28 verse number 9 says this, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. You know what you, the, the children need to learn? They need to learn doctrine. You know what you need to learn as a parent, as an adult? You need to learn doctrine. There's not this special services. That's not taught throughout the Bible. But you know what you see, and this is, you know, I'm not going to go into great detail of this, but repeatedly when you look at the services that are held in the Bible, do you know always what you see? You see the preacher addressing the, the adults, and he's addressing the children all at the same time. They're all present. You know what else you see? You see the adults being mentioned or the parents being mentioned, the men and the women being mentioned, and also their children being mentioned at the same time in the same services. We, need, we don't need to try to soften the Bible for them. We don't need to water down the Bible for them. What will end up happening is they're not serving God in sincerity and in truth. Like if, let's just say that it's like this. You want, some, you want your child to enjoy you know, a glass of, I don't know what, just a glass of some sort of drink, right? But when you take, let's say, water and dilute that drink down, would you say they really enjoy that in sincerity and in truth? They don't really do that because they need it to be watered down. They don't really truly enjoy that in sincerity and truth, do they? What we want them to enjoy, we want to, you know, we want our children to love the Bible just the way it is. We, we don't want to change it. We don't want to make things, oh, let's just make it, you know, let's just change it in this way form just to cater it unto them. That's not what we want to do because we want them to love the Lord, love the hymns. We want these are the songs of the faith, aren't they? Amen. These are songs where we're learning things, we're praising God. The word they have meaning, right? We want them to love the Lord in the Bible in sincerity and in truth. And you know what? You're disabling them when you have this other sort of service 
when you set up this situation where it's where basically they're getting 1% Bible and then it's 99% entertainment during this period of time. We want our children to love the Lord thy God with all their hearts as well, just like us as well. I want you to go now to I want you to go now to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. <clears throat> Let me say this as well. If someone is interested maybe in this room in getting into the ministry, maybe being a pastor, they need to do that and they need to make that choice in sincerity and in truth. There can be different motivations to this. There are many people you could probably think about that wanted to get in the ministry for wrong reasons. That maybe they wanted to get in the ministry just to be a leader or just to be because they're a proud person or just because they want to be the center of attention, right? There could be a lot of wrong reasons why a person can desire to get into the ministry or to serve God, right? Maybe, you know, uh, they're a nerd and they want to get authority. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. I need to turn there myself. That popped in my mind last minute. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. Now, the other point here is we need to serve God from our hearts. We need to serve God in sincerity and truth. In an area where you think, where do we serve God? Where is it the biggest area? When you say, hey, we're serving God, where does that take place? What well, takes place at church, doesn't it? So this is another point. We need to, when we come to church, we, we need to be coming to church to serve God in sincerity and in truth. It can be very uh, easy to begin to go through the motions when we come to church, can't it? You know why? Because we have a routine. We have a routine, so it, it can be very easy to that just, for that just to become routine, just to become tradition. Because in, in one sense, it is tradition, isn't it? It's a tradition to go to church Sunday morning. It's a tradition to go to church Sunday evening. It's, tradi it's a tradition to go to church Wednesday evening, isn't it? So you know what can happen is where it's just tradition. It, can, it, gets, it, it is a part of your routine. Well, it can become just, just routine alone. We need to make sure and we need, to be, uh, we need to be wary that this does not creep into our lives where we are no longer coming to church to serve God in sincerity and in truth, but rather that it is just tradition. This is, of course, even more so possible with maybe children. They go to church. It's just tradition. It's routine. They're forced to go, right? And when they grow up, maybe they continue to go. And why do they go? Tradition. It's what I did when I was a child. It's what my, my parents did all the time. That's why I go to church. That's why I go to this church. You know, if that's you, you need to stop and say, hey, I want to start coming to church in sincerity and in truth. I want to come to church and serve God in sincerity and in truth. Once you look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, this is actually specifically what's talked about here in verse number, uh, uh, verse number 7. First, I'll give you the context. This is speaking about when uh, the man had committed fornication with his father's wife, right? And they're throwing him out of the church. So this is specifically speaking about and in regards to the church, to the congregation, to the assembly. It says this, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So he's speaking to the church, and he's saying, purge out, you know, the leaven. Get rid of the leaven out of the church, right? He may be a, a new lump. Verse 8. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. And then he says this. But with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And he goes on to explain, I wrote unto you an epistle not to, not to company with fornicators. So he's speaking specifically to the church. The way the operations and the things will go on with people while they're gathering, who they're around. You know what he tells you to do? Keep it and do these things in sincerity and in truth. The practices that we have here, we need to do them in sincerity and in truth. You know, it, it could be even singing the song sometimes can just become what? Routine, man. It just can can become traditional. It can become when you're, you know, this is a song that I've sung since I was a child. A lot of the songs that we sing, we sang in my church since literally I was a baby. You know, they, they've always sung certain songs, and they sing the same songs over and over again at the church that I grew up in. So these certain songs, for me, the more you hear them, you know what they can do? They can become routine. They can become tradition. They can become where this is just, you're not doing it in sincerity and in truth, and you just know the words of the song just so well, and you can just sit there and sing. But what's the purpose of singing? What's the pur what, is, what does David tell us all throughout the book of Psalms that we should be doing while we're singing? 
I mean, Psalm 150 is just like, praise him on this instrument, praise him on this instrument, praise him on a string instrument, praise him on this, praise him on that. He just goes through like every known or possible instrument that exists. Praise him on this, praise him on that. Why do you sing? Can you say from your heart right now to me, because I cannot, every single time that I sing, that I am purposely making, you know, uh, 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 making a conscious effort in my mind to be directing all of the words. All of the words of my mouth are directed at God for praise. Every time you sing, did you say that? I don't believe you if you said that. And I'm sure no one would, right? Of course not. But you know why we need to be singing every time? Well, the way that David writes, I believe that a lot of the time, of course he's human, but a lot of the time, he wrote a lot of psalms, and a lot of the time, you know what he's doing? He is with all his heart praising God in song. With all of his heart, he's singing. You know, when he wrote the song, he is serving God by song in sincerity and in truth, isn't it? And you know what we need to be doing when we sing the hymns? We need to be praising God. We need to be, this is a way we should be singing loudly and giving uh, you know, honor and praise and glory to, you know, to Jesus. And you know what? It doesn't matter how great of a singer you are. I'm not that good of a singer, which everybody's like, hey, man, I knew that, right? I, you know, I, I, was a, I was an even worse singer until I just recently, about two years ago, just started making more of a conscious effort of trying to sing in tune. I can hear, here's the problem. My dad has played music my entire life, like constantly. All the time he's playing music. So I have a very good ear for music. You know, a brother Elliot knows music well. He knows that I know when somebody's out of key, I can call it like that. I can hear whether you're in key or not extremely well. So that means that I can hear when I'm out of key all the time. And I can hear that I, I'm not a very good singer. You know, I, I'm much better than I used to, but guess what? I sing loudly all the time. And I sing loud, especially there are certain songs that I love to sing. And the reason being is because they are sincere in my heart. And I'll sing super loud on certain songs. Amen. There are certain songs that just pull at my heartstrings when it's praising Jesus, the things that he's done for us. And when I start singing loud, most of the time it's because I'm singing to God in sincerity and in truth. And we need to get to a place in our Christian life when we're singing the songs, when we're singing hymns, that is, that we are praising God in sincerity and in truth. I don't care whether you're a good singer or not. I'm not a good singer. Hey, I, I'm going to tell whether you're out of key or not. But we'll both be out of key together. Because I'm just going to sing loud whether you like it or not. I don't care whether you, if you have a good ear or not, that doesn't matter to me. Because I'm going to sing loud because I'm not singing for you. The reason I'm here is I'm not singing for you. You know, it's, it's I, the whole purpose that I come to church, the whole purpose that I sing the hymns in the first place. And if I lift up my voice, the reason why is because I want to praise God. Because I want to praise Jesus in sincerity and in truth. Sincerely in my heart, I want to give him praise and glory and thanks. And I'm grateful. Just like uh, we talk about the free will offering. What compels you to do something or to give back to God? And this can be in all areas. The Bible talks about the sacrifice of your lips, right? Giving praise unto his name. That's a way to sacrifice back for the things that he's done for you. You can praise and glorify him and make a sacrifice through a song with your lips. Give offering through your lips with a song and praise God for what he's done for you. I want to look at another uh, area where we need to be sincere. I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 15. I'm going to read you uh, from uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 24. It says this, Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. We need to love the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. We need to truly have a sincere love for our Savior, for Jesus Christ. 1 Samuel chapter number 12, verse number 23 and 24 reads, Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Verse 24. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he hath done for you. Notice what he says. That's very similar to Romans chapter number 12, verse number 1, where he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Notice he said, I'm beseeching you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Here he says the same thing. He says, serve him in, in, uh, in truth with all your, hot, your heart. And he says, for consider how great things he has done for you. So look at all the great things that God has done for you. And that should push you and that should compel you to serve God. 
in sincerity and in truth. Another area where we need to <clears throat> serve God in sincerity and in truth, and serving, of course, is work. It's work. So I have you in 2 Timothy chapter number 2. This is in reading and studying our Bible. This is a, a type of work that you do. The Bible talks about that it is, it is a hard work and that you're a workman. Look here in actually in 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Look at verse number 15. It says, <clears throat> Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to be uh, reading and studying the Bible and growing in knowledge in the Bible. And we need to be doing this in sincerity and in truth. Now, there's a couple applications to this. Number one, you know, I make my children read the Bible. Michaela, obviously, who is now can read and has been able to read. She now can read since of last year. No, I'm just kidding. She can read. So she's been reading the, the, the Bible for multiple years as soon as she was able to read. That is a perfect example of something that can become routine, isn't it? Where you, you are forced, especially by your parents, to read the Bible every single day. And it's day after day after day after day. It's a tradition, isn't it? It's routine. Now, not all traditions are bad. But when it becomes just tradition, it's bad. It needs to be done in sincerity and in truth. When our children read our Bible, we need to be speaking to them and exhorting them to be doing this. And modest them. Read your Bible in sincerity and in truth. When you sit down and read your Bible, read it in truth. Read it in sincerity. Read it because you love the Bible. Read it because you love God. Because you want to communicate with Him. This is the way He speaks to you. This is the way you get to know God. This is how you want to know God? Read His Word. This is how you're going to get into the mind of the Lord. You can know Him. There's no other, uh, no better way to know Him. He put His mind in a book for you so you can get to know Him the, uh, you know, the best way possible. But not only that, even ourselves. It's possible that... You can maybe just read the Bible, and I'm getting ready to uh, use a couple of, of, of examples of this in just a moment when I'm segueing into the conclusion. It's possible that you could read the Bible for the wrong reasons and just to show off, right? To flaunt knowledge, maybe. And there are a lot of people, of course, that are uh, the epitome of this, the James Whites and the scholarlies of this world, that you can see, hey, you're not really interested in the Bible. You don't really love and care about God's Word. You are just attempting to, you know, basically showcase your brain. That's all that you want to do. You want to showcase all the knowledge that you have about the Bible. And that's possible where we can get to that same point, isn't it? Where we're just reading the Bible just so that we can maybe know the Bible better. Just not because we want to put it in our hearts. Not because we want to actually know God, but so that we can basically show off. Where we can basically like uh, make it just look like we just want to express to everyone, hey, I, you know, I'm, I'm a really smart guy, right? Just draw the attention to ourselves. But notice here it tells you to study your study to show thyself approved unto God. So what's the reason why you should be studying? So you can be approved unto God. You should be reading God's word. Obviously, we should be reading God's word for a lot of head knowledge, but also, you know, uh, subsequently to that is that we should be applying it. You know, the ways to be approved unto God is, number one, study so that you know the Bible and you can rightly divide the word of truth. But also, to be obedient to God's word, you have to study it first, learn it, and then put it into practice. This is a way to be approved unto God. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. How are you going to keep his commandments if you don't know them, if you don't study and read the Bible? Another thing is memorizing the Bible. Right? I preached about the importance of memorizing the law last week. We could get to the point where we're just memorizing in general, just speaking of anything, or maybe we're memorizing the Bible just to show off. You know, that could be very possible, because not a lot of people do that today. It would be very easy just to memorize Scripture and just quote it at any opportunity where you're doing it just to show off. You know, kind of like memorizing a whole book and then quoting it as a sermon. And I always thought that that's ridiculous. I honestly did. I thought that this is a waste for every person here. There's no purpose to this. And then people will follow your foot on footsteps, and then in a preaching class, a person did the exact same thing, where he just quoted a smaller book. What's the purpose of that? Honestly, I'm not using that just because, you know, uh, I'm, I'm resentful or anything. That's a perfect example, and honestly, it. that's why I don't need a name drop. It's a perfect example of... Uh, and, and here's the thing, you know, all of us can have these flaws in our life. You know what I mean? You can, if, it, you can in all these, in these areas, you can have little small uh, problems here, maybe a bigger problem here. That's why we need to apply these things and hear preaching about these subjects. But what would be the reason why someone would memorize a book of the Bible and then stand up and spend an hour of a sermon just quoting that book? 
Is he edifying the saints in that? He's not preaching. He's not explaining the word of God in that. Of course, you could say there's ed there's edification by them hearing the word of God just in general. But is that what's supposed to be going on during the services? It's not. The purpose of our services is to where a preacher teaches. That's why the, the, the bishop who stands up and, and gets behind the pulpit, he doesn't just get up here and just read the word of God. He doesn't just get up here and just read a book. Do I just turn to these uh, uh, passages, read them, and then just turn to the next passage, just announce another passage and turn to the next passage and read it? Well, what would be the point of the qualification to be apt to teach? It's because you have to be, you know, teaching the word of God is what the bishop is supposed to be doing. That's why he's told to feed the flock of God, which is among you, right? You're supposed to be teaching them. You know what the priest did in the Old Testament? We read it this morning, actually, where it talks about they've been without a, a, a certain time, uh, without the true God, and without a teaching priest. You know what they were supposed to do? Teach. They were the ones that were the, the there was a, a segment of the of the priests that actually copied, right, all the manuscripts and everything, and they preserved and kept the word of God. And also among them, they would take the word of God and they would teach it, right? We have Ezra, we have the example of Ezra. What did Ezra do? He stood up and he taught the people. It talks about him teaching, right? The, the, the priest taught the word of God. We need to be teaching the word of God. We, so memorizing the Bible is great, but it needs to be to benefit you in, in your daily life so you can recall these and bring these scriptures to mind in the areas and times when you need to apply them. And also you can benefit other people with them, not by just like coming up to Brother Russell, Hebrews chapter number one, verse number one, and I just begin quoting the whole book of Hebrews. That's ridiculous, obviously. That's not edification for him, right? No, that's, we need to not be doing things out of just uh, uh, vain glory. And that's exactly what I'm getting into. We need to be doing things in sincerity and in truth. And if you want to memorize the Bible, obviously, let me say this too. Let me, I meant to mention this uh, in the very beginning. But before I, I close the sermon in just a second, let me say this first. When any area where you're serving God, it is still best to at least serve Him. Even if you are doing it with not the right heart, the Bible clearly teaches, you know, that you should be you should be keeping the commandments anyways. You know, the Bible talks about uh, 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 in in uh, the law when He gives the commandments. Obviously, it doesn't matter whether you're sinning, you know, uh, presumptuously or anything like that. God basically explains that He just wants you to be keeping the commandments either way. Even if your heart's not right, you should still keep, still keep the commandments. Even let me let me let's think about this for an example. You know, uh, uh, adultery, right? The punishment is severe. It's to be put to death. Now, uh, if someone keeps that commandment, that particular commandment, as far as they keep themselves cleansed and clean, and they are innocent of doing such a thing, obviously God, and they, and let's say that they wanted to and they had the wrong heart about it, okay? But they never did it. Obviously God would be, would be much more pleased with that person. At least they didn't go out and commit the act. You'd be out of your mind to think, well, they might as well have went ahead and done it. Of course not. That's silly. Right? God would be much more happy with that person than if they would have just said, Oh, you know, my heart's not right. I might as well just go ahead and commit adultery. That's foolishness. That's silly. So when, you know, uh, serving God in these areas, even if you are going through the routines, it's better to be at least serving him than to be not serving him at all. Right? It's better to at least be serving him with and not, and not fully in sincerity and in truth than to just give up. What we want to do is then take the next step from serving God, maybe not having the right heart in some of these areas, but in, to the, 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 the next uh, plateau of serving him in sincerity and in truth, and doing it with the right heart, doing it, you know, uh, in truth. So uh, I'm going to read to you quickly from Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 5. The opposite of sincerity is, of course, hypocrisy, right? It would be a person that is uh, a person that is not sincere about something. Would, it could be referring to a person that is a hypocrite. It says in Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 5, When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. So no, that is a reason why people can, can do things not in sincerity and not in truth. It can be because they just want to be seen as men. Another reason can be, as I've mentioned a few times, just because they're going through the routines. 
of something. The going through, this is just a tradition. Matthew 23, 5 is a very similar concept. You know, it says, uh, but all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. So, so of course, referring to the Pharisees, which are a perfect example of not doing things in sincerity and truth. And they weren't even saved. They weren't even Christians in the first place. Right? They didn't even really believe in Christ. It wasn't an example of someone that had put their faith in Christ is going to church and doing all the right things with their hearts. <coughs> right. Of course. You know, uh, but we can still use that as a bad example of what not to do. So we need to do soul searching in every area of our life. Every time we're serving God, we need to not just be going through the motions. We need to not just be going through the routine of, hey, it's Sunday night, we've got to be at church. It's Sunday morning, got to get up you know, uh, and go to church. We need to uh, enjoy going to church. We need to enjoy going soul winning. We need to enjoy waking up, reading our Bible, teaching our children the Bible. We need to enjoy doing the things of God and serving God. We need to strive to not only doing what's right, but doing it with the right heart as well. Serving God in sincerity and in truth. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for the great example. Uh, we thank you for the great